It feels like we're living in the age of the great swap. Like the natural is being swapped out for the ersatz. The synthetic. We've got all these promises. We're going to be technologically upgraded. Everything's going to be technologically upgraded. And I just feel like the whole thing is being sold with the same slick veneer you might get from a used car dealership commercial. A local one. Synthetic food for your physical body. Synthetic feedback loops for your program. Synthetic mindset. Come on down. Get yours today. Right? This is an ad I saw on Instagram for what this company is referring to as a chicken nugget simulation. Which, according to the ingredients, is actually true. Because the stuff, I guess it's passable for food, but it's not really what most people would call healthy. (laughs) But the claim is that this is more advanced than an animal-based nugget. And also that this will kill you slower. Which is just, it's always nice to be reminded that companies can give the masses ads that don't have to come with even one tiny shred of evidence to really back up the claim that what they're selling you is going to do anything that they just said. But they're calling it a simulation. I guess that's a trendy new way to sell things to people. I mean, I lost count at this point of how many episodes of the show Black Mirror have just simply come true or are based on actual technologies that are in the works. I mean, here's here's a question. If the predictive programming isn't even predictive because stuff is just happening in the so-called fiction pop culture media at the same time that it's happening in reality or just slightly before, can it really be called predictive so much or is it really just programming? I mean, at this point, are you really just watching basically a commercial for a product that's being packaged under the guise of a science fiction TV show? And to the point that you got to wonder if, if what's showing up in supposed fiction is then coming out within the f- few years or even a few months after you see that. You have to wonder what other science fiction have we been predictively programmed with that's going to then become science fact as well. So I've been kind of floored at some of the stuff that's coming out, but I think, I think that the thing that takes the cake on this one has got to be Zoltan Istvan's quantum archaeology, which is a phrase that if you just heard it, you might think that Indiana Jones went to CERN or something. You you know, what does that even mean, right? Well, I'm sure you've probably seen that they are now using digital footprints to program algorithms so that people can talk to a chatbot of their deceased loved one. But it's not even going to remotely stop there, right? Because they're talking about in the future combining voice synthesis with photorealistic 3D avatar technology with augmented reality so that eventually you can just have your deceased grandma walk through your kitchen the way that Tupac gave that concert at Coachella in 2012. And you'll just be able to talk to her and have whole conversations and it'll just be like she's there even though she's even though she's dead. But according to Sultan Istvan, it's not even going to stop there at all because he's saying we're going to get to a point of just 3D printing people back to life. You might recall Istvan. I've spoken about this before. He's the guy who popularized the term ectogenesis in modern, post-postmodern culture, which is the artificial pregnancies that will take place in these matrix pods that they've got, which they've already done with lambs, the artificial womb. He's also the transhumanist presidential candidate from 2016 who drove around the country in the immortality bus, which was shaped like a coffin, extolling the virtues of the transhumanist view of living forever and how we're going to cheat death through technology. He wasn't joking around on that he believes that within the next 30 to 50 years we're going to be 3d bioprinting people back to life and that may sound crazy at first but when you go through and read all of the technologies that are happening and how those technologies that you've probably heard about here and there will be combined in order to try and attempt to do this it's i mean it's something that they've been working on for a very long time but now they're announcing to the public they've got it within reach which means it's probably already 
closed or perfected. I mean, there's debates that go on all the time about, you know, how far behind is the general public with the technology that we have versus what's actually being created in privately funded labs and government labs and stuff like that. There's a debate. Where are we on what we actually know about versus what's actually being had by those in high places of power who can afford it. Isfan's also running for president in 2020 against Donald Trump. And I, he's just promoting, he's out there promoting these ideas. I mean, that's really, I think when candidates like this and Andrew Yang, who ran on a platform of UBI and stuff like that, I think the point is really just to get those ideas out there on a national level and familiarize a large portion of the population with them. That's, an, that's a chance to do that under the guise of running for office. It's not about actually winning anything. It's not like they think they're going to. I think it's more about familiarizing the masses with these concepts and getting them out there. And also then once you've done that, you can, you know, you can take polls and data and see how how willing are people to accept these ideas? How how much do they agree with possibly getting on board with some of this stuff? So, anyways, Istvan isn't just somebody who's running for these offices, though. And he's, he's not just some guy talking about this stuff on a sandwich board, you know, to himself on the side of the highway, either. This is somebody who is being hugely pushed and promoted in the mainstream. In case the planet ever really gets very overpopulated, you know, many transhumanists subscribe to some of the Star Trek ideas. And yes, it's, it's a great opportunity to, to say, well, let's explore space then and get off this planet in line to do some of these cranial implants to be some of the very first people already to start communing, uh, you know, having thoughts that go directly into AI, regrow those forests and then have meatless meat. We're going to be wirelessly connected through implants, technologies that commune with these very sophisticated different types of intelligences. By then, you'll already have robotic eyes with some of us. This is someone who has spoken at the World Bank, the elite World Economic Forum at Davos. He's been invited to speak at Microsoft and Harvard, I guess, to the Ivy Leaguers of our future leadership or whatever. He was also the opening keynote at the Financial Times Camp Alphaville. And he's getting full pieces printed in Newsweek. So this is someone who's being very much heavily promoted with these ideas in the mainstream. They want these ideas to be out there. They want people to realize this is what's coming. So he goes through here and he calls it quantum archaeology and how they're going to be bringing people back to life, resurrecting the dead, an entire physical human being. And then he says, but before we delve too far into real-time technological resurrection, which he says is being spurned by the burgeoning transhumanist movement. If he would just call it technological resurrection, by the way, I think he would get a lot more people to pay attention to him. Because again, quantum archeology, span that's probably gonna go over the heads of most people. Technological resurrection, however, and he points out the fact that there's all this stuff that's going on right now, that's what he calls the daily noise of the politics and the bickering world religions and the dark environmental warnings. But he says behind all that stuff, where people aren't really paying attention, basically, is a civilization changing phenomena that's occurring. And it's been occurring ever since computers were created. This has been going on. So society at large and the world at large is being changed continuously and faster and faster now. It's picking up speed, especially since the 21st century began. So while people are being distracted by the shiny things of all this other stuff that's going on, in the background, the world is being fundamentally and forever changed. The entire civilization, the entire world. And then he repeats this argument that we've seen a whole lot about how if we don't merge with computers, we're going to become this unintelligent species, Elon Musk said, we'll be like pets. But even the benign situation, if you have some you know, if you have ultra-intelligent AI, um, we would be so, so far below them in intelligence that it would be, would be like, you know, a pet. To the artificial machine intelligence that we're creating. So it's putting everyone into this double bind where they make it seem like you don't have a choice because the only smart choice to make in that situation, the only smart chess move is to merge yourself with the technology which they claim is just gonna keep getting better and better. But I mean, the self-checkouts down the street at the grocery store by my house break down all the time. 
The idea of people merging their brains and bodies with technology just, I don't know. I think it's kind of a joke. I don't think we've been given any assurance at all that having a world run by these things is a smart idea. I mean, things have already gone horribly wrong with some of the experiments that are being done with these technologies. Anyways, they're saying they're not just gonna have like these 3D avatars of your dead loved ones walking around, they're actually gonna be able to 3D bioprint people back to life is the claim that's being made. And that they're gonna take all this CRISPR and all this other technology, they're gonna put all of this stuff together and they're gonna be able to make actual people back from the dead. The scientists specifically are starting to fuzz the line between life and death. He goes through all the ways in which that's gonna take place and he says, critics will say we could never print something as complex as a human being, but they fail to grasp that the 3D printing industry and 4D printing where printed objects can move themselves later is literally in its infancy and growing exponentially every year. One day in probably 30 years, we will be able to print anything, including human cells, DNA, and even memories, which is something scientists already did with mice back in 2017, printing memories. Again, how many Black Mirror episodes have come true? By the way, there was a Black Mirror episode about the chatbots. It was a 2013 episode called Be Right Back, where a widow was able to collect her dead partner's digital footprint which was all the videos and photos and emails and texts and auto recordings and social media posts and everything he ever did and reconstitute him, not just into a chatbot, but a realistic Android. So that was a Black Mirror episode and it's something they are absolutely working on. In fact, there's a company, I think it's based out of Canada that is secretly, but they've talked about it just in vagaries that is working on the surrogates idea from the Bruce Willis movie Surrogates that came out in the, in the 2000s. Soul Machine could be making the first generation of robots you want to speak to. Ones where you don't get that creepy feeling in the pit of your stomach because something is off. Ones you could have an emotional attachment to. And isn't that what we all want? So that's, that's actually happening. This stuff is all actually being worked on right now. Is a very real possibility that we can bring him back through these two different methods, through 3D bioprinting, which will be here in 3D, 30 or 40 years, and through reverse engineering, exactly what his molecular formulation was like two months ago, right before he died. We call this quantum archaeology. This mm. this whole field, and it's growing, growing. There are now entire nonprofits dedicated to bringing back every single person that's ever lived. And Isfan even took it so far as to say that we need to take away 501c3 status from churches not because it puts them under the yoke of government control, but because taking all the money that churches will then have to pay in taxes, they can then use that to resurrect Jesus with 3D bioprinting. And the implication is that that is even fulfilling the prophecies of the second coming, <laughs> is to, to resurrect Jesus with the bioprinting. So that's a claim that he even came out and made. They're also talking about printing Adolf Hitler so he can stand trial for war crimes, just all kinds of, of stuff. But if you go watch Isvan do some of these interviews on this topic, there's one that really kind of made me cringe. And it's the point that I want to get to here, where they were asking him about the nature of consciousness. Consciousness. So whether I even believe in an afterlife, or what, ha you know, before, what happened before I was born, I'm not even sure it's relevant when you could create it. In, in, it's not an afterlife to recreate someone. It's kind of like, well, there was always that possibility. And now we're just, I guess, uh, manifesting that possibility. Because you can maybe print the machine. If, you're, if your whole view of human existence is this hardcore scientific materialist view that we're basically just biological computers walking around in skin suits, then, you can print that, but is that going to be the person? Is that going to be the person with their spirit, with their soul, with their consciousness intact? Or is it just going to be this mindless clone that doesn't have a soul? I mean, are they they're really trying to act like they can put the ghost in the machine? Because I, I, I fail to see where this is being answered. And this was directly addressed in an interview with Isvan. Uh, I'm just going to play the clip. 
let's take your brother-in-law, for example. So what actually occurred to him after death? Where is his consciousness now? And if you did 3D bioprint him back into reality, would that still be him? Where would his consciousness be? So, you know, this is the biggest debate ever that is by cloning somebody, is it them? And well, I guess at the exact moment of cloning, it is an exact replication of that person. I would say to myself, that is me, because my person back would say, I'm me, you're, I'm you, you know. But I think, you know, once time takes place, they kind of start evolving quickly and become a little bit different. But I'm just not concerned whether a perfect replication of myself is or isn't me. All I care about is that it thinks it's me. And um, because in, in my feeling, it's all about kind of the ego and not in a negative way, but just the ego saying, I am alive. I think therefore I am. Um, I can feel these things. I can imagine I'm creative. I can, you know, I have reason to make things work. That's enough for me. And um, I think ultimately whether when we bring my brother-in-law back and all these other people, if we, if that ever happens, is it going to be the same well, they're, they're probably like, let's say they're going to be like, let's say you brought back someone and the, per, the spouse is remarried or all the businesses. I mean, this guy was a very successful businessman has been sold off. I mean, that person's going to like going to have to deal with that. So in that way, it's a very real it's it is the person because it's saying, oh, you know, this is my wife or that's my business. And all these things are different. I think um, I'd say it is the real person. It is when you bring back somebody and they're an exact compilation essentially of you know, that molecular formulation, then that's, that's good enough for me. See, I don't feel like this is what's being addressed at all. They can't define really even consciousness. I've heard some of these cosmists like Ben Gertzel talking about the consciousness. They don't, they can't really define it. And their argument is you can't either, but if you're, uh, I'm not the one going around making claims that I'm going to upload the consciousness to a computer somewhere or to a quantum intelligence enclave or whatever it is that they're calling it these days. I'm not the one making those claims. Okay. So if you're the one making those claims, then you got to put your money where your mouth is and be able to explain exactly how it is that consciousness, which is something that a scientist can't you know, pull down a chart of your body and brain and say, here's your consciousness. It's located here. I mean, they're still figuring out the ways in which your brain interacts with your body. They recently discovered that you have neuron receptors in your stomach. I mean, all kinds of things are going on with your brain. You have all these debates going on with these, you know, 3D avatars of dead people being printed with neurologists and psychologists and ethicists on whether or not this is even a healthy, normal thing to do to carry on a relationship with someone who's died through technology, which is not really a real relationship with that person. I don't know. It may sound real because you've now programmed a computer to mimic the consciousness of someone, but that's not their consciousness. And it's not interacting with you energetically. Do you know what I mean? Like, okay, I can get a robot dog and that robot dog can bark and wag its tail and I can pet it and stuff. But the relationship that I'm going to have with that dog is not going to be the same as the relationship that I would have with an actual dog who relies on me for sustenance and being walked and going to the bathroom and love and affection and the energetic exchange that will then be taking place between me and that dog. It's not going to be the same just because you programmed a robot to bark like a dog and walk like a dog. It's not the same. The natural process of what is taking place there is not going to be the same. And what I will get out of that energetically and what that dog would have gotten, a robot won't get, <laughs> okay? Because it's a robot. You can approximate life, but does that make something truly alive? I mean, you can't even define consciousness. You can't locate it. You can't say where it is. Your mind is not your brain, right? So, but we're going to put that in a cloud. And by the way, they are coming out with shows about this. In fact, they came out with a show about this after Isvan went around talking about it. It was, there was a show just a few months ago, came out in October on Netflix called Living With Yourself, stars Paul Rudd. And the whole point was he was going to go through a treatment that was going to upgrade him. But what they did was they made an upgraded clone of him and, but they didn't kill him. The whole point was he was supposed to be killed and his upgraded clone was supposed to take his place, but he didn't die all the way. So now he has to live with an upgraded clone version of himself that does everything better than him. It's not really him, though. 
is it? Although, according to Isman, it is really him. So how is that possible? There's two hymns now, I guess? I don't know. The thing that really bothers me about a lot of this is there, there, I had an exchange with Isfan last year and I saved some screenshots of it just because the response is what really did it for me. I couldn't believe it. So my friend Gans posted some, one of Isfan's articles on his Twitter account and Isfan came in and responded to it personally. And he responded and it turned into this whole argument that was going back and forth between people in in the feed of comments, and I don't remember which article it was, but it's along the lines of all this kinds of technology. And it ended up with Isfan asking, why can't you download the love of Jesus? What if doing so saved souls and made people kinder and more Christian? What if downloading the love of Jesus was a method that God gave to humans as a way to get to know him? Why is experiencing the Holy Ghost downloaded somehow different? It became this whole debate about downloading the love of Jesus and why isn't that possible through technology and I think I went in there and I posted a gif I didn't screen cap my gif but it was a gif of that lady doing a spit take because I said did, did this fan really just ask if you can download the love of Jesus because the question itself to me just seemed comical it didn't seem like a real question but it was a real question that he actually had and he came in and responded directly to me and said no one's given me a good answer yet as a human being, being in the presence or love of Jesus is still a neurological phenomenon in the brain, which means we can reproduce it by creating the same signals in the brain via brainwave tech. If that's not experiencing Jesus, why not? And then you had Micah Redding come in. He's from the Christian Transhumanist Association, which is a phrase that my brain doesn't even really compute, honestly. And they kind of went back and forth discussing this. And I responded directly with, a question that was not answered. And I said, how is using technology to send signals that directly stimulate the brain to artificially induce the feeling of an emotion classified as the same thing as authentically having that emotion? That's my question. How is it the same? I mean, here's the thing. Blade Runner is a really good movie. It's based on Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. But the part they leave out of Blade Runner is at the beginning of Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, where Deckard and his wife are having this argument over the setting of their pinfield mood organs, which are these little boxes that can stimulate your brain into hundreds of different emotions. And his wife has secretly been stimulating herself to feel feelings of horrible depression and things like this because her brain is so jacked up on artificial signals that she doesn't feel connected to actual reality anymore. And she just wants to feel something authentic. So she's making herself feel negative emotions because the, the happy, the, the positive ones feel fake. What's the difference between this and a love spell? A magical love spell. If I do a magical love spell on someone 500 years ago to make them think they're in love with somebody, if, is that the same as experiencing actual, authentic, natural love with that person? Or have they been technologically manipulated? Now, maybe my technology was a little more primitive, but isn't that the same concept? I feel like there's a difference. And these people who, again, are promoting all of these future technologies and speaking at places like the World Economic Forum and Microsoft and Harvard and the World Bank, they're going around with this belief system where it's the same. If you just artificially stimulate your brain to feel happy or feel love, that's the same as love. That's the same to them. And I, I disagree. I don't think that it is. And I don't think it's an argument or a debate that you can make on just scientific technological grounds. There's a lot of other considerations that come in here. Spiritual considerations, which no one's going to just automatically agree on. But when these are the people that are being pushed and promoted in the media, and these are the ideas that they're promoting is this future where we're all gonna live in basically a Philip K. Dick novel and just diddle with our brains all the time to feel certain ways and tell ourselves that's how it is. I mean, you could see how you would eventually live in a place like the rusted out stacked trailer park of Ready Player One, where everyone's just happy because they got their VR helmets on and don't seem to care that they're living in abject poverty and squalor. <laughs> you know, this is what makes me so mad that it's just all going to come down to, well, you'll be happy when you get your VR helmet on and you can pretend to go somewhere else. It's not the same as going there. 
Everybody thinks they already know what's going on because they went to Twitter today. And that's a, that's a representation of reality. It's not, though. <laughs> you could be told all day what something's like, but until you actually get off of your computer chair, out of your house, and go there and see it for your own self with your own eyeballs and experience it for yourself with your own physical body at the place where it is occurring, you don't actually know <laughs> what's going on. And a lot of us are living whole lives in fear based on links being shared on social media outlets and, and the structuring of search results. If you took that stuff and put it in a box for a week and went outside and walked around in the woods, none of that stuff would be affecting you at all. And then that wouldn't be the reality you live in. You'd be living in a totally different one. That's how easy this manipulation happens now. So I can't imagine getting to a place where we're just creating signals in our brains via brainwave tech the way Zoltan's talking about, and that's going to just sub for everything. I mean, I guess if we're all just, if we're just jacking our brains and calling it good, but it's not real, is it? Is it real? I guess that's the question. I guess that's the question that's being presented here. I mean, you can 3D bioprint your grandma all day, but that's not your grandma. And you could stimulate your brain all day too, but that's not a real emotion either. It's not authentic. And I have a feeling that there are ways that our brain interacts with our body and the energy that surrounds all of us that these things will affect on deep spiritual levels that we're not even, I guess, going to talk about because we're just going to pretend like we're just biological computer meat suits walking around that can just be jacked up and down on some apparatus. I think it's incredibly sad that those are the ideas that are getting pushed and promoted as answers to man's problems. You know, is living forever our biggest problem? I think being able to have a quality of life at all is one of the big problems that a lot of people have right now. Making ends meet at all. Let's go around and, and promise everyone that we're going to live forever and go to Mars instead of having a roof over your head because you can afford the rent instead of a, a land filled with empty, repossessed houses while everyone's building tent cities under the highway or having to choose between paying your rent or going to the doctor when you need to because that's a, that's a decision that's being made all the time, every single day in, in this world while people with infinite amounts of backing and money are going around talking about how we're going to just live forever in the quantum computer. And by the way, a lot of this live forever immortality is not you getting to actually just be you. It's you uploading yourself to a quantum intelligence network, which again, I mean, they can make a close approximation. They could even 3D bioprint clone people or whatever, right? But is it you? How, how can the argument be made that it is? I just want to end this with this questionnaire they gave Istvan that I came across in Quartz, where they, they asked some of the boldest thinkers what the world's going to be like in 50 years. You got to hear what he says about this. Because if this is the way he's selling people on this idea, I'm pretty sure it's going to fail. <laughs> like they got to figure out a, a definitely a different PR way of selling this because it sounds awful. So they asked him who's going to run the world in the future. And he said, he straight up says, there's not going to be countries. There's not going to be nations. There's not going to be economies. Everything is going to merge into one thing. And it's going to be run by an AI network. And that includes the people too. A giant AI network of quantum intelligence. It's all going to be merged as one. And the humans are going to merge their brains directly with the machines. And if you merge your brain directly with the machine, I guess the promise is that you won't work and you won't have to suffer. So that's the thing they're, they're saying. You get to live freely in the virtual world once your brain is merged with the machine. And by don't have to work, what he's saying is, quote, you will give up some control of your life and that will be your payment into this world to exist. It doesn't sound like some control. It sounds like all control. If you're merging your brain and yourself into a, an AI quantum hive network, it sounds like you give up all control completely to exist. That's what it sounds like. And everyone will be communicating through their thoughts in these quantum intelligence enclaves. There'll be no eating, no breathing, no drinking. You won't have to use the bathroom. The flesh will be gone, paving the way for the exploration of how intelligent we can become. I mean... 
First of all, is how intelligent we can become really the, the most important goal of your existence? Is it? And also, whose definition of intelligence? <laughs> and, and the promise is you won't have to work and you won't die. And they said, how will we find love, Zoltan? And he responded with, love in a romantic way will cease to exist. Well, that sounds great. That sounds amazing. We're not even going to talk about the importance of what love is or what that means to an individual's life. We're just going to act like you don't even need it because you'll be only willing to communicate with the nearly all-knowing AI that you're connected to, which in fact is one with you. However, this AI will be connected to everyone else too, so we will always be interconnected in a sort of hive mind. Well, I'm glad somebody said it. Because when I say it, it's like, look at that crazy tinfoil hat nut job talking about hive minds again. Okay, well, now it's being talked about by people that go to the World Economic Forum and speak at the World Bank and, and Microsoft and Harvard. Okay, so it's not just me saying that phrase. That's something they're actually legit talking about, as if it's a real eventuality. And he goes on to say... Let's just skip on down to the end here of like how all this is going to play out. They ask him, what's your best prediction for the world in 50 years? Best. Let's see, are we going to end on a happy note with all this wonderful technological upgrading? How awesome is the future going to be, Zoltan? Tell us. Well, he says, quote, a great transhumanist war will occur between those who embrace radical technology in their bodies and those who don't. Many will be affected by this time and some will call it the end times. Then he says, those that side with technology and AI will win. I'm not sure if he really believes himself when he says that, although I do see why some people might call this the end times. So in the next 50 years, there's going to be a transhumanist war. And earlier in this thing, he calls it a civil war of sorts, which is interesting because they've been using that phrase in the media a lot in the last decade. But, um... Great, so there's not going to be any love. You have to pay with giving up control of yourself and putting yourself into a hive mind of sorts. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? Again, this is like a used car dealership commercial. It's, it's, who, who, how is that going to sell? So you can pave the way to become more intelligent, which is not even defined here. That sounds like a really bum deal. That sounds like a bad Twilight Zone episode. It really does. <laughs> Nothing about this sounds awesome. That's not a world that I'd like to live in. I hope I have unplugged everything and I am living in the woods by then because I'm not interested. <laughs> I'm not interested in it at all. Look, my argument here is this. You can't define consciousness or point out where it is. How are you uploading it to a cloud? How are you doing anything other than just getting some close approximation through a digital footprint that can, you know, sound like a person, which is basically just an AI algorithm mimicking somebody? How, that, there's a difference between that and actual consciousness. How is stimulating your brain to artificially induce an emotion the same as actually having it? Yeah, I know. They, they know how to stimulate brains and make people think things and do stuff. But, you know, people who have put these these technologies into their brain stop feeling human after a while and they've had that problem and they've interviewed people who want to get that stuff taken back out because they feel like it has turned them into a non-entity it, they may it feels like they're not they're not here anymore they don't feel like a human being anymore i mean i feel like all of this is about dehumanization i know they call it transhumanist transhumanist transforming humans but I feel like in order to be transformed, what they're really saying is you have to dehumanize first. You have to break it down. Let's break it all down to its components and its parts. And then we'll just press buttons. I read Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, but it didn't really seem all that appealing to me. I mean, these, this is the, these are the people that are being propped up to promote this future, to promote this ideal, to try and sell this to everybody. And I'm saying... It just comes off as a used car dealership to me. Seems like people are going to be giving an awful lot away for a clunker. That's really just, that's the way it's being sold. That's just the way it's coming off. So I guess what it's actually going to come down to is between an artificially stimulated Philip K. Dick novel where you take the blue pill out of the Matrix and tell yourself it tastes like steak and you don't care. And the people who simply can't live that way. <laughs> 